this from the band called Slaves being the new watching pure metal the gods, motherfucker! Hey, this is Mike from Nocturnus AD, and you're listening to Pure Metal Gods. Max Cavalera here, man. Sending you good metal vibes. Good luck with your podcast. Good company. Keep it metal. Keep supporting the metal world. The whole universe of metal. Hey guys, this is Sasha. And Andre. From, from Major, Major Moments. Moments. You're watching Pure Metal of Gods on YouTube. Rock on. Hello. My name is Zombie Manning and... and this is Gate Open! And you are listening and watching Pure Metal of God magazine on YouTube. Let's rock! Hi guys, this is Dennis Prophecy, and you're listening to your Pure Metal of God on yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fuck yeah! This is Matt Miller. And this is Jordan Kelso. And you're watching Pure Metal of the Gods magazine on YouTube. Hey, this is Jeff Patera for that. And you're watching Pure Metal of the Gods. Stay black, stay protect. This is Pure Metal of the Gods. I'm Denton Cartwright, your host. I'm here with Mike Browning, Nocturnus AD. How are you, Mike? Hey, man. Great to see you. You you know, Mike, you got so many groups that you've been in. I'm getting all tongue twisted over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about um your new album that you guys just got done recording. How's that coming along? Um, is actually uh, the recording. All the recording is done. Um, we still haven't uh, started actual like big mixing yet but as we were going along recording we were kind of doing like having ideas like hey i want to put some 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 um you know delay here on the vocals or we want to put some flange on the guitars in this part so um jared pritchard who's doing the album um he he has made a lot of notes and pro tools and stuff where we're going to put stuff as far as effects and things like that so all the recording is done but the problem was um it took longer we had a several things happened you know from the recording and and our bass player's mom passed away and 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 things like that happened so things took longer than we were going to send him my and, condolences by the way yeah well yeah actually he's um you know he's actually not in the band anymore now wow. but he had several other things going on in his life and you know and this has been it's been something that's been going on for about five years and we we've you know, gave him a bunch of chances to straighten up and it's like, it happens for a couple of weeks. He straightens up and then it just goes right back into the same problems. And I don't want to say anything bad about anybody, you know, of course, cause I, I still am friends with the guy, but we have a band to do and, and, you know, we have to have, you know, somebody in the band that can, can be there all the time and do things. So are, are you guys auditioning right now or did you find a replacement? Yeah, we've, we've got a new uh, bass player now. And it actually just happened last week. We, uh, we've, uh, well, we've been kind of um, having him come out the last couple of weeks and work on some songs with us. And his name's Kyle Sokol, S-O-K-O-L. And he's on Facebook and um, he's done, he's like, uh, he did some stuff on that new atheist thing uh, about um, Under the Dirt or whatever it's called. I can't remember the name. Okay. Uh, the new thing Kelly's got, the new project. He, He's done it a lot of bands. He's uh, been in the Tampa area for a while, and he's a really killer bass player. And, you know, he's got stuff on there, like where he's playing, you know, atheist songs and things like that. So he's, you know, that caliber of a bass player. And, uh, cool. you know, our, our one of our guitar, guitar players, we're pretty good friends with him. And, you know, I've kind of met him several times because he's been in the area. Uh, and uh, he's been around for a while since I think, I think he moved to Tampa around like 1989 or something like that, 1990. So he's, you know, he's somebody we, you know, we know, kind of know somewhat. And so he came out and started, he actually tabbed out several of the songs um, and, uh, you know, by himself and then came in and, you know, I mean, that's, that's tough to be able to tab out songs by yourself, you yeah. know, so if you could, if you could do that. And he was close on a lot of the stuff right off the bat. So, uh, you know, he's came out, I think, uh, 
three times now mm-hmm. or four times uh he's come to practice with us and and um he's already got like five or six songs down how's your chemistry and him um matching the guitar on the, not the guitar the drums and the bass how's that really good. That's good um the thing the problem was like with, with daniel he he would only come like once every couple of months you know and so most of our practices were just guitar drums and keys you know keyboards so i haven't had a good you know like several practices in a row with a bass player in a long time uh you know like you know we'd see him and he'd come and then like several weeks would go by and he wouldn't come to practice because we practice like basically try to practice every saturday Um, okay and uh we practice here at my house we have a uh, like the whole garage has been converted into an air conditioned studio and stuff. So, you know, we can re- do our little bits of recording here and, you know, stuff like that. And so it's, it's been really nice having our own place to record and play and practice and everything. And it's all soundproofed. And so we're, we're lucky on that end, but yeah, yeah he's been, he's been coming and, and, and uh, it's been awesome. He's got a six string bass. Oh, uh, he, he's he really, that? He, how does he play? He I mean, play. that's like so thick, you know. I know he does a lot of yeah. The neck is like huge on that thing, but he's he's got really long things like you know all over the place. But uh, he's like a prog type bass player too. He can do all that stuff. Oh, that must and, be a good chemistry. With I'll you tell guys. you, yeah, it's really nice having somebody there that just like you know like actually puts even extra stuff in the songs. Yeah, that's cool. Um. I know when we last talked, um, I think it was last year, you tracked out all your drums in like a week or two, if I Not remember. One, in one weekend, actually yeah. two days. Really? Yeah, like I said, we did. We started back in October with this, you know, and we did like recording. And then uh, the problem, is, like Jarrett, he's a really busy guy. He runs sound too, like live sound. Yeah. And, you know, he does all the Tom Warriors project, Trip the Con, you know, the Hellhammer stuff that he's redone. And he, he did even did some shows, some of the first Dark Angel stuff when they got back together this like you know, this year. And oh, very he cool. Did some of that touring and he's always constantly on the road doing stuff. So it'll be like he'll, you know, we'd come in and record like say the drums the first weekend. And then, you know, we'd wait like two or three weeks and then we'd go back in and, you know, for the next time he was in town, because he lives in Orlando, which is, you know, an hour and a half from tampa so we would drive That's without you know, traffic yeah yeah exactly you're right <laughs> yeah sometimes it would take a good two hours to get there yeah but you know we would literally go there and, and uh you know saturday we'd leave really early and you know go there and record all saturday till about nine or ten at night then we'd drive back and we'd come back sunday and do maybe six, six or seven so we did two days every you know saturday and sunday for off and on all the way till the end of the year and then you know um we had to wait for the bass like a month because stuff kept happening to Daniel and, and he had to cancel a couple weekends in a row. And then, you know, we finally got the bass tracks done last mm-hmm. and, and um, you know, everything's recorded though, at least. So, and then he had a bunch of stuff in a row going on. Jarrett did with uh, live shows and he's been flying back and forth, you know, and things like that, but he's kind of gets a little hectic, stuff. right? A little hectic yeah. on the big stuff and all that. Being but, you know, the one good thing is, um, you know, there's been things like, you know, with when we do some albums, we, we have like a week in the studio, like with Nocturnus, right? So you have seven days, basically, or so, you know, six days, whatever it ends up, five days, whatever it is, to do a whole album, and you're done. Now, let you me know? ask you a question on, speaking of the original Nocturnus. You guys were the first ones to bring in keyboards into death metal and doing that sci-fi um, trilogy style of music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, how did you guys come up with this idea, this formula? Because I, I know when you guys did it and um, a lot of groups thought about it, but you were the first ones to plant the seeds for it, to actually do it. Well, you know, I mean, up? being that I'm almost 60, I grew up in the, and you know, in, in the sixties and seventies. And as a kid, I listened to a lot of music and, you know, used to go buy albums and, you know, play albums all the time. Cause they didn't have, they didn't even have cassettes back, you know, at first, you know, 
Um, you I know, so, those days. <laughs> I know. You know I mean, and then CDs came out, what about late eighties, you know? Yeah. And so oh, before all that, I used to go get albums all the time. There was a, a album a record store not too far from my house. And the guy that owned it, it was like a, it was a uh, import type, you know, independent store. And the guy, he was a, a little older than me and he used to love all the British heavy metal stuff, you know, like Maiden and Angel Witch and stuff like that. So he yeah. would always order all these albums and he'd always have them playing in the store. So I used to ride my bicycle up there before I could even drive a car. And, and, you know, he'd show me the album cover and he'd be like, listen to this song. And he'd play, you know, a couple songs off the album and I'd buy it, and you know, run home on my bicycle and play it. And But you know, growing up in the 70s, a lot of bands, every band you listen to, you know, I was big on Led Zeppelin, things like yeah. that. And they all had keyboards in them. A lot of bands had keyboards. Well, that's true. All them 70s bands did. Yeah, so to me, it was not like a weird thing to have keyboards in your van, you know, and I, I, I never really looked at a formula for a band. I just, you know, ended up, you know, being a singing drummer, and that's not a formula either. I just, whatever works and whatever, you know, that, that comes out, and, and I, I just want to be original more than anything. I don't want to follow anybody, what anybody else has done. And I used to get these demos a lot that would have a keyboard intro or, a, you know, from a movie intro or something like that, you know, back back in the in the 80s. And this intro would sound fantastic. And then the band would come in. And of course, they recorded the album on a boombox in their garage. I mean, <laughs> the, the demo. I, I remember those days. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of them. Yeah, I did. I did several, too. A lot of those Nocturnus recordings were just a, a boombox. In the early days, you know, the early stuff. Uh, Did you guys throw we, like a blanket over the boo box to kind of dampen some of that rattling sound? of the? Yeah, well, actually, we would put uh, like masking tape uh -huh. across the speakers. That, that worked quite well, too. But a lot of that stuff was just, you know, somebody would have a really good sounding intro because they got it from somewhere else or they did it, you know, direct right on a keyboard. And so it sounded really good. And then the band would come in and be like, all, you know, like that. And and we used to use the reel to reel. Yeah. Well, yep. no, not many people had a reel to reel system to record on because you had to have multi tracking and all that back then. We and would that, actually, because um, our neighbors, they were big, like, you know, music heads, and they would have like one reel, and then I had a reel. And then another neighbor had a real so we would literally make our own multi-track and then get a, a you remember the radio shack mixing boards oh yeah 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 we would connect them all to the mixing board and mix them out and then put them on a cassette tape on the boom box and <laughs> then, that's how we did our trade trading back then you know it was kind of a little mm -hmm. bit more professional but not really but it, it worked so right. i know yeah, where you're you coming from you had to do to get a recording out but the the main point is that that they would have this intro that sounded really phenomenal, and then the band would come in and it'd be recorded on a boombox. So there was a huge difference between the intro and the and the music in the demo. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, well, I want to have all of it sounding good. You know, I want the band to sound like the intro. So I always liked weird intros, even when I was in Morbid Angel. Uh, a couple of the shows we did we had intros on tape that would play before we played a show. And, uh, it, you know, it was stuff like, uh, like there was a band synergy, a really weird stuff, kind of like a tangerine dream. Mm -hmm. And we used to use stuff like that, you know, their stuff just, just as the intro. And, of, and then we'd come out and play. Speaking of Morbid mm -hmm. Angel, when you were in there, you were doing um, vocals in the early days on drums, well, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah we had, Several people did sing in Morbid Angel or tried out, you know, and a lot of them just weren't getting it right or, you know, didn't have the right sound that we wanted. Because and I, I knew all the, the stuff, you know, the, the lyrics and everything. I was very familiar with everything because me and Trey mostly did everything uh, back then. And uh, so I just said, you know what, 
I used to like Exciter a lot and their drummer sang. Mm-hmm. And that was that same era, you know, that they were putting out albums. And I, and I was like, well, I'm going to try singing like him. And I did. And since I knew the lyrics and everything, it was just kind of natural. Uh, I didn't have to, you know, try too hard. And, you know, the death metal, you just sing like you, you sing, you know, you growl and it comes out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it wasn't like I had to sing like, Jeff Tate or something, you know, from Queens, right? <laughs> so I just said, I'm going to do it. Cause I know the, the songs cause you know, we put them together and, and I know the lyrics cause I wrote some of them and, you know, I did. And it just kind of worked out. That's where I wanted to get into because the way you were singing on it. And then when you left and David um, joined David Vincent, um, he still mimicked your style on the vocaling because if you listen to the the old um Morbid Angels um when you guys were playing in like um somewhere in Tampa um outdoors somewhere because you can see some of the water park or the the bay area and right. um you can hear your vocal style but I noticed David kept up that same style that you did back then Well you know I mean when we we got signed to a label which David owned called Goric Records, right? And that show you're talking about was called Rocky Point Beach Resort. It was like a, a hotel on the water. That's the and one. They were they were getting ready to 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 tear down the resort and build a new one there. So they were like, we're going to have this big bash right at the end, and the whole hotel's going to get torn down. So we don't even care if the hotel gets messed up at all because it's going to be you know brought to the ground yeah you know demolished completely so i'm so we had a weekend thing there with you know like several bands and two nights and like everybody was throwing tvs out the balconies and you know putting holes in the wall the hotel because they didn't care they were like do whatever you want here because it's going to get torn down anyway you're helping us actually you know by (laughs) so it was a crazy weekend but that's a teenager's dream though to do something like that and get away with it yeah, it was incredible. We had a great time. And the funny thing is, there's two different recordings of that on video. There's a close-up one, and there's one farther back. And the the one that's farther back, you can actually see David Vincent in the audience watching us. Oh, okay. I didn't know that one. Because we had actually recorded, by that time, we had actually recorded the album already, The Abominations of Desolation. It was already recorded, and... If you watch that video, I'll, I even say that, you know, like between some of the songs, I'll be like, yeah, this is going to be on our new album. It's a, we'll be coming out on Goric Records and all that. So he was actually at the show. The album was already recorded, everything. Wow. And so when you departed, he joined, he just came in and redid the vocals for them. Yeah, yeah. And they uh, had a different drummer at first. Wayne Hartzell was, was the drummer that David... David had a band and he was trying to get Trey to join his band back then. And Trey didn't want to because he was had Morbid Angel. Oh, that was Trey's um that was his baby, Morbid Angel. Yeah, and it always has been, you know. I mean, it's 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 his he came up with the name and you know, uh, the guitar, all the guitar stuff is him. So, yeah. you know, there's nothing wrong with that for sure, him wanting to keep that and he didn't want to be in another band at the time. Cause back then in the eighties, you really didn't play in a lot of different bands like people do now. Yeah. Kind of had your, band. and that's kind of like the way it was. And David had just, they had a guitar player in his band. I think they were called something like Baron cemetery or something like that. Um, but they needed a guitar player and he was trying to steal Trey out of morbid angel <laughs> and, and for his band. And Trey was like, no, I'm not going to do it. But then when we split up, before the album even came out it was like well richard and trey went up there because david had a lot of money he had a backer with a lot of money and Mm -hmm. so they went up there and you know but trey said i'll do this but it's going to be morbid angel and that's when i was just like well well i did incubus because sterling was our our new bass player at the time and he had a band called incubus uh in georgia before he joined morbid angel so yeah i mean we recorded the album and I think it was around April and David was just like, I think he was maybe thinking of trying to get in morbid angel at the time, but 
I didn't really get along with them too well ever. And, and you know, right off the bat, I, it was just like, we didn't, we kind of clashed, I guess. Yeah. And, and so I don't think he really wanted to join morbid angel, but he told us our bass player was terrible. His name was John Ortega. And he goes, well, uh, I know a couple bass players. So he sent Sterling over uh, from Georgia to Florida and he tried out for us and he was really good. So we ended up getting Sterling, but then, you know, like several things started happening after that. And so we split the band split in half and Richard and Trey went up there and joined with, with uh, David and Wayne. Ooh. And then, and then, uh, you know, Sterling and I stayed here in Tampa and we got a guitar player, uh, which ended up being, um, you know, Gino. And uh, so we had, it ended up making two bands, but that, Incubus only lasted like six months and I was, I couldn't, I, Sterling was a maniac. He was just, he was really insane. So yeah. And it was, uh, so I tried to work with him, but he was really crazy. Like, you know, just insane. <laughs> he would start fights with people in the post office and, you know, things like that, like everywhere. What are you looking at? I'm going to kill you. Or, you know, he would just do, I mean, anybody, he would just start picking on people all the time and, starting fights and that's how the incubus broke up him and 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 uh, gino i was at work and they went out to the beach one day and they were hitting on these the, these couple of girls and and sterling said something to gino and gino punched sterling and and knocked him down almost knocked him out and then you know he quit the band and sterling was uh, you know freaking out after that happened and i was just like this is just too much drama for me so i right. left <laughs> you know and i'm like and I'm just going to do my own thing now. So that's when I came up with Nocturnus. Yeah, but you've been in a lot of different groups. I mean, all the way up to um, uh, Ashron. Um, I think I pronounced it correctly. Ashron? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, Vince calls it Asheron. Yeah. I mean, them guys, I mean, I don't know if you were on the Out of Body album. I think you were. No, no, I only did. A couple things with with Asheron. The weird thing, see, Vince was actually the first guitar player in Nocturnus. Really? Yeah, he was playing guitar back then, and he had a band called Entity, and I I had seen them play a few times, and and uh, when I started Nocturnus, it was just me and Richard Bateman, just bass and drums, and I was singing still, you know. So I was learn, you know, I was writing lyrics, and and me and Richard were kind of coming up with you know, songs, just bass and guitar, I mean, bass and drums and vocals. And so we got Vince in the band and then Gino came back once we kind of had things going a little bit with, with, with Vince. So the first Nocturnus was really just three people, me and Vince and, and Richard Bateman. And then we got Gino back in the project. And then, you know, Gino didn't get along with, with Vince very well. And so Vince moved out of florida he kind of he he doesn't really like living in hot climates <laughs> he likes it up north where it's cold yeah, so he's like, a little bit warm. yeah especially now it's gotten worse now but yeah. you know he moved and that's when gino had a cousin named mike davis and so that's when we got mike davis in the band and and the first demo was well the first demo was actually richard bateman me vince and gino and that was in 1987. So oh, cool. after Vince quit, we did the Science of Horror demo in 88. And that's when when we got uh, Jeff Estes playing bass because Richard joined Nasty Savage. They needed a bass player and they were already very established playing huge festivals in Poland and stuff like that. So when they needed a bass player, he kind of just was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to join this band because they're already going and we were just struggling trying to keep things going at the time you know you can't blame the guy though i mean he had no, an opportunity course. yeah you know you get a big opportunity like that to join a band that's very established and touring and getting lots of money already you know signed to metal blade mm -hmm. you know they already had a, one album out i think maybe even two uh so you know i don't blame anybody for things like that and that's when you know uh mike davis knew jeff estes so they all went to school together and they, and I said, we should get a key. That's when I said, we should get a keyboard player, you know, uh, to do some intros for us live. So when we, we have stuff to play live and they're like, Hey, we know a guy that we went to school with. And, and that was Lou. So he wrote a couple intros for us 
and then he came out to our warehouse and we plugged him through the PA. So it was really loud. And, and, and he played the intro and then we went into a song and, and um, while we were playing the song, he started actually kind of like playing along with us, like in some parts of the song, I think it was BCAD. And, and uh, it was just like, wow, this actually sounds really cool. And this is exactly what I was talking about having an intro and then having the band still sound the same. Now, this is where I'm going to cut in. Um, if it wasn't for you guys doing that, I would have never brought in keyboards in my music for my first demo and continue on with it. So I want to thank you personally for that yeah. idea. I know it's <laughs> funny, you know, that we got, uh, you know, like branded as the first death metal band to use keyboards because I don't think that's really true. I know other bands had keyboard intros for sure. But and there was probably some bands out there that had a full time keyboard player. They just didn't get, you know, super popular. So, I mean, I don't know if we were the first that have it full time, but I think we were the first to really put out an album that featured it, you know, as full time. And I think that's what 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 ended up happening and how we got labeled, you know, the first death metal band with keyboards. Well, I mean, either either way, I mean, you kind of coined it because of that album and especially with what you guys wrote about having this android come back um through time to kill christ <laughs> you know to stop the christianity religion i mean it was very interesting on that first album and then you guys kept it up you know and then you guys i, I don't know how it came for nocturnus ad to be nocturnus ad from nocturnus but I mean, that's well, a deal if you want to talk about that. Well, what really, I mean, it it was, uh, well, Mike Davis loved the old, like, sci-fi movies from the 70s, and I did too, of course, Planet of the Apes, you know, uh, you know, there there's a movie called Andromeda Strain, things like that. I've you never know? heard and, of that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's an actual movie. That's uh, really where that idea for that song kind of came out from that movie. Um, cool. So when we got the keyboards, it was very sci-fi sounding. Yeah. And, uh, Mike was like, let's, let's, uh, expand the lyrics. Cause I was writing mostly just evil occult stuff on the first Nocturnus demo. And just kind of basically what I had done, even in morbid angel from the lyrics that I had written, like chapel of ghouls was mostly my, my lyrics. Hellspawn was all my lyrics. Uh, you know, uh, there was a couple other ones and, 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 I always arranged the lyrics and the songs because I was playing drums and, and Trey would always come up with the rhythms, but we would put the songs together together and, and like, let's do this eight times. Let's do this four times and cut into this and this bridge, you know, we would always put the songs together together. He would always come up with the riffs, but that's the way we wrote the songs. So, and the same thing was happening in Nocturnus, of course, because I was singing. So I, I like to, I'm pretty good at like putting songs together. I don't play guitar, so I don't write the riffs. But you do but... play a little bit of keyboards, right? Oh yeah, yeah, I definitely, you know, and I really don't even know what I'm doing as far as <laughs> note wise on the keyboards. It's just like since I've listened to stuff for so long, I I can kind of play, but I don't really know what notes I'm playing, but I know what sounds I'm playing. If that makes any sense to you, I can I can play by by ear more than I can so it's very hard for me to I, like I couldn't I could probably learn another song on keyboards that way if it's not too complicated. But it's not really the way I used to write down the notes on the keyboard, you know, literally uh, with a a permanent marker. I'd write down the notes so I knew what notes were what. That was the only yeah. way I could figure it out. Yeah, that's right. I never really thought about trying stuff like that because I, I always just played by ear. And then what mm -hmm. I would do is kind of like try to remember the, the the fingering of it and nothing was super complicated for me so you know that i, I didn't play any like piano pieces so <laughs> right. it was all mainly just you know soundscapes and things like that and i'm uh you know i'm i i like doing stuff like that because it's fun you know and uh I, i'm pretty i don't know why i'm good at it but i i can just do it so i've done a lot of keyboard stuff even though i don't really know what notes i'm playing it actually i can do stuff pretty good with it and, and uh so that's kind of like what happened with that 
you know, we had the keyboards and 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 Mike said let's write some science fiction stuff together. So he gave me some ideas and a couple lyrics here and there. He'd like scribble out a couple lines and then I would put the whole thing together and write the rest of it, and making it into a song like Neolithic and and uh, was was an idea. He's like let's do a prehistoric song uh, and call it Neolithic. That was actually his title, and, and I was like sure. You know, and so he gave me some lines and, and he did the same thing with like uh, Droid Sector and uh, and Andromeda Strain. And from there, you know, we kind of like started writing more together uh, lyric wise. And uh, so as we were writing the newer songs like Andromeda Strain, Droids, Destroying the Manger, and then empire of the sands it became well this is actually coming out like a little story these last four songs so it was a very loose story on the key but it, it worked and then my idea was to carry it into thresholds and, and uh at first i was even singing on the songs so we did uh one of the songs uh that was on thresholds when we did the uh, tour for the key we were actually playing it live grid zone and I was singing it, but then earache, since we were signed to the label, the, the vis videos were just starting to come out. You know, you had M M you know, MTV was doing, you know, Headbangers Ball, and uh, earache was like, look, we can't have a singing drummer behind this huge drum set because when you guys tour, the guitar players don't move around very much. The keyboard player is stuck behind the keyboards. You're behind this huge drum set. You can't even see your head. And people are wondering where the lyric, you know, where the vocals are coming from. They're just out of, you know, they're like, and back then, you know, you didn't have like, we weren't playing huge places with big cameras where they have, you know, like on each side, these huge screens and things like that. So a the lot of, they were like, show. so your live show really is, is like, it's kind of like not a live show. <laughs> and uh, they're like, so we need you guys to have a front man. And they, they, they told me, Dig told me from Eric, why don't you quit playing drums and sing? And I said, well, I'm not really a vocalist, even though I'm I'm the lead vocalist in Nocturnes. I'm not really a vocalist. I don't want to be out front, you know, just singing. I, I'm i really a drummer. So, and, you know, and everybody else in the band was like, so Eric started saying, well, unless you guys get a front man and either, you know, you just play drums and get a front man or you be the front man and get a drummer, you know, we're going to cut your budget. We're not going to give you a video, things like that. And, and so everybody in the band was like, we need to get a front man. We need to get a front man. And I really didn't want to do it. I, I was just like, let's stick this out and, you know, just do what we can do and keep things the way they are. But nobody wanted to do that. So it was kind of like four against one. So I said, okay, we'll get a singer. And we got a singer. And at that point, everybody wanted to start writing lyrics too, because, I'm always, even now, even though I write all the lyrics in Nocturnus AD, when we get royalties or play a show, everything's split evenly. Yeah. And a lot of bands don't do that. You know, if like if one person writes all the music or something, they always get like, you know, paid a lot more. And, and I didn't want to do that with this band. I wanted everybody to feel like they were equal. No, that, that's and, the way it should be, though. Yeah, that way there's no green, big ads. And, and, you know, Lou was like, oh, I want to write lyrics and we're going to split things the way, you know, people get credit for. And, and it was all about money. And I was like, this is terrible. And this is not a good idea. And then, you know, we got a front man and he was writing lyrics somewhat, too. Although he didn't write a lot of lyrics, but he was writing some of the lyrics, too. And, and everybody's like, well, I'm writing this part. Well, I'm writing this part. And it started getting like arguments started happening right away because everybody was trying to write the most that they could to you know because they wanted to make more money than the next person in your own band and i'm like this is not good and we started having lots of arguments and things like that and so thresholds not one song off the key was continued on thresholds story-wise by the lyrics they were all new songs with all different ideas and that's not what i wanted to do i wanted to continue that key story on thresholds yeah, so, you wanted a part two of the chapter. Right, exactly. And and so that didn't end up happening. And then the album came out 
and it sold like 30% of what the key did. So now the label's like, well, this is terrible. You know, what's going on here? You know, how but come it's, it's the not... label's fault. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was their fault. Yeah. And I was like, well, I was the one that wanted to keep things the same. So instead of that happening, the keyboard player goes behind my back and steals the name because he knew I didn't trademark it, but I didn't think you had to trademark it if you had product out and signed and everything. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, and you know what? Let's bring that up because a lot of people don't realize this. When you start a band, you know, definitely copyright the name, whoever is starting it, and protect yourself because look at what happened. Well, I mean, it is a little different nowadays because mm -hmm. you you have a lot of um, if you have merchandise out and you're selling it under a particular name and you can prove that. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, like, like if you have a contract with a record label and things like that, you can prove that you had that name in, in what they call commerce situation. And now that they have that, it's a lot easier to, if somebody was to try to take a name now and you've already been using that name in commerce with contracts and everything. And it's, it, it's a, a lot, but when somebody goes behind your back in the, in, in your own band, that's a different situation. Yeah. Now, if somebody were to come out from Europe and try to take the Nocturnus name, they probably couldn't have done that. But okay. this was somebody in the band. So, well, I mean, you and Venom and Venom Inc. had the same story going on. I mean, because if you remember, Cronus did the same thing to Jeff. And Jeff had formed the group way before Kronos ever joined it. And Kronos went and copyrighted it under, right under the, underneath their nose. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, I, I understand where you're coming from. It can only happen when it's somebody in the band, because if somebody else, like I said, that doesn't, wasn't ever involved in it, tries to steal your name and you have commerce out things sold under that name legally, Mm -hmm. then you can get a lawyer and win that case easily. But like you said, now going back to it being in the band, you know, don't you think it's better to copy, um, to trademark it so they can't do it? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely for sure. But the way things were going, if we had done that back then, everybody would have wanted to be on the trademark anyway. Not, I couldn't have just done it by myself, even though, none of those people that were on the key were even in the first version of Nocturnus. <laughs> oh, man. So what what happened afterwards after they stole the name and because of the label and all this, what happened afterwards? Well, you know, I, I was tired. And like I said, there was lots of arguments going on when we were on the Thresholds tour. I woke up one morning on the tour bus and I heard fighting and davis and lou were actually on the ground outside the bus punching each other and i mean all kinds of stuff was happening it was like it was ready to explode big time but and, there shouldn't be any reason for it you know it was i was it was a lot of it was greed you know and that's just the that's just the way it goes somebody that was never in a band before came into the band never did anything music wise before that got in the band and, and their head grew so big they got an ego and they wanted to run everything oh, you know God. they wanted to change everything they wanted it was and because all those guys went to school together they all knew each other i didn't know any of these people when when they got in the band i didn't know any of them but they all knew each other jeff mike davis sean and Lou all went to school together. So they've known each they had known each other for years. So I, I was I was the odd person in Nocturnus because I was the only one that didn't and I was older than all of them by a couple of years <laughs> only, but still. But it ended up that they were all good friends with each other before I even knew any of them. Wow. So, so that's how things that end up happening, you know. But later on you formed Nocturnus AD and so you you protected yeah, well, I knew they broke up mm -hmm. and and I was going to do Nocturnus again because they weren't using the name and they were all split up. And as soon as I did that here and then they, they realized that it was getting some traction. They were like, oh, no, we're going to do Nocturnus again now. <laughs> so 
and Lou still owned the name at the time. So they uh -huh. actually had a lawyer send me a, 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 a season a you can't use the name Nocturnus. <laughs> so I had realized that a couple of bands, you know, used the name and added something to it. Right. So I didn't do that for a while though. So I just took the after death mm -hmm. from before Christ after death and kind of made a band called after death. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, that's where, well, now I know where that comes from. <laughs> Cause I came up with the BCAD name, you yeah. know, that, that song was really pretty much the first song, uh, you know, Richard Bateman and I wrote when it was just bass and drums. So I came up with the before Christ after death thing. And I thought after death is a cool name. So let's, uh, I'm going to start a band called after death. It has a nocturnist connection. And, uh, so that happened and I did after death for several years, but it, for some reason, you know, it's very hard. It just never took off. No, it and, wasn't, uh, it, it, I guess in a way it's trying to establish a new name is harder than when from the previous one. So I think you made right. the right choice going using the Nocturnus AD, you know, yeah. on that. It was um, weird because Nocturnus AD and After Death, when it first, when they both were going at the same time in the right. beginning, it was the same band. Exactly. Every single person was the same. So I, you know, we did a, a lot of Nocturna songs in, in, in After Death when we played live. And so we had been playing those songs for a while, you know, just stuff off the key. We never did anything that I didn't sing on and didn't write lyrics to. So everything we did play, I had something to do with writing. You know, most of it was pretty much all the lyrics. So a lot of it and or most of the lyrics, at least. So every song we did, I had something to do with. I recorded it and been on in Nocturnus. We didn't do anything from Thresholds live because oh, I didn't uh, sing it. And uh, I only wrote uh, some a couple of lyrics in on Thresholds, just like two songs. I wrote some of the lyrics and they were all written by everybody else in the band. So that's why I've never really done Threshold stuff live because mm -hmm. I just I wanted to stick with doing just the key stuff because that was what I wanted to continue. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to put a band together called Nocturnus AD and continue where I wanted to continue after the key. And I, I think you did pretty good with that because I mean, when I heard um, Paradox, yeah, I mean, fuck. I fell in love with it, and <laughs> that was a great song. Thanks, um, man. I, we were, you know, we we had some of those songs for a, a while uh, before we actually ended up recording the actual album. We had six or seven songs written, and we did a, a our own little demo. And I've just put one song out. We had six songs recorded ourselves, and I put one song out, and under the name Nocturnus AD, and, and it just it just took off. Like I'd never seen after death take off before, and it was the same people. Really strange, but it was the same people. But and, I think uh, that had to do with the name change too. So it really did. It really did. And and then we had like four or five record companies going, We want to sign you, we want to sign you, we want to sign you. And it's yeah, like, let, wow. Let's, let's talk about that because I mean eventually you guys settled with the label that you're on now. Profound um, lore. Yeah. So how did they approach you and what did they do to sweeten the pie for you? Well, I mean, basically it came through Facebook mm -hmm. and everybody that was writing me, we had several labels that were interested in signing us. And I, I had an idea that I wanted to have, you know, this particular budget so we could do a good album. I didn't want to $2,000 to where we have to mince on everything and make it sound okay. Yeah. I wanted a good budget. I didn't want a huge 10 album contract or, you know, I didn't want a huge contract. I didn't want to be with too big of a company where we got lost on the label with a thousand other bands. And, and I wanted a video. So the problem was all the big labels that would do a video want to, want to sign you for like you know at least five albums and they right. they they want to give you like you know 15 percent of the royalties <laughs> you know? it's like 
you'll never see much money from a label like that unless no, you tour it, it, exactly I, I didn't want that situation i thought well it'd be much better to be on a smaller independent that does have a good name but they can put more time into you as a band and you can be one of the bigger bands on a smaller label rather than being a smaller band on a bigger label right you know and that was my idea and and uh basically a lot of labels wanted to give us you know a, a decent budget you know four or five grand to record an album but they didn't want to put in a couple you know thousand dollars for a video also because videos don't really make money i mean you know themselves no, they they, but it but it does help you get your fan base going, especially on exactly the, you know, the visual so I, effects. You know, and Profound Lore was uh the guy that owns Chris that owns Profound Lore. He he's he actually loves Nocturnus. So yeah, you know, I the first time we talked to each other, he goes, you know what, you know, I think you got a good idea. We can give you a good budget. We can sign you for a couple albums, um, and see how things go, and we can give you a video. And I said, that sounds perfect. And so he gave me his phone number and we talked for like two hours the first time we ever talked. And that was the label owner. And so, you know, I, I got to talk to him for, and it was like, he was on board with everything I wanted to do. And it was perfect. And they had um, Portal at the time. Mm -hmm. And Portal was really popular at the time. And they, and, and we had just played Australia and I met the main guy in Portal and we were talking and, and I said, how is Profound Lore as a label? And he goes, dude, because we, you know, we're doing really well right now and we have a bunch of labels interested in us, but Profound Lore has been really good to us and I won't go to another label, you know. That's and, cool. And do that that says a lot. He said they were very honest and everything. So to me, yeah. Uh, I, you know, when he told me that they were a great label and they were honest and all that stuff, I was like, I think this, I think we found what we're going to do. And, and we did go with profound lore and Chris has done everything he, he promised to do every time we're due our royalties. He's right there, you know, with, with the statements and, and everything. And, and uh, he doesn't push us to record by a certain time. We really had no time limit because this album, I mean, we recorded in 2018 Paradox and look at what year it is now. Of course, COVID really messed a lot of things up, you know, for like two years to put everybody kind of behind. Yeah. It was like, how, how did you guys cope with that? Lives are just missing almost now because yeah. of COVID. Yeah. I mean, how did you guys cope with that? I mean, writing wise. Well, the good thing was we we all live in the area. You know, and we have a free practice place here at my house. So we did end up staying together that way. And we never really were a band that relied on touring to make our living. Yeah, you got a normal job. So, yeah, we all have normal jobs. And touring was just something we did when we wanted to do it. And that was another thing with Chris. You know, he doesn't wasn't like a label that's like, oh, you got to go out and tour six months of the year to be on our label. And, you know, we couldn't do that. I mean, we probably could have, but I would be, you know, back living at my mom's house if I did that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Right. You know? Because I, either way, to me, it's about the music and playing it, not having to play it in front of a million people. I, it, you know, it's great to do that. But to me, I like writing and recording music. And we do that on our own terms. And even though we have a contract, we still do it on our own terms, and we we play when we want to play. You know, um, so when when a band relies on on that for a living, they're they're playing and touring all the time. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you're stuck in that situation. If you're not playing and touring, you're, you're not, not making, making money at all. Yeah, that's why you're you not, see so many live. groups and multiple, so many people in multiple groups. Yeah. And and I kind of don't like that being put in that situation in my life. I like having a house. I like having, you know, I have a daughter, all kinds of yeah. things. I have a life. Uh, it's not just living on a tour bus. 
But, you know, your, your label did do an awesome job on the video because when I saw the video, I mean, especially um, what's your mascot's name again? I keep on forgetting. Dr. Magus. Yeah, Dr. Magus. When they made the mascot on the video, I was just like, wow, you know, this is really cool because you're making your own video game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, with that, I mean, even on the key, that was his first appearance. But back then, he really didn't have a name. He was just an evil scientist doctor. You know? And, and uh, so when Nocturnus AD came out and we continued the key, I finally said, this guy's got to have a name. You know, it, it's uh, Iron Maiden has Eddie. Right. So I said, we got to have a name for this guy because he's he's a character now. He's a central character in the story. And before it was a very loose story on the key, but it was a story. It ended up being a story the way the songs were arranged and everything. And uh, and it was just the last four it really started with Andromeda Strain into Droid Sector into um, destroying the manger in Empire of the Sands. So that was basically the real story of the key right there, those four songs. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, when we do Paradox, the last four songs on Paradox, except for the outro, which uh, was the instrumental, but the last four actual songs with lyrics and stuff will, are, are going to be exactly like with the key. And if you look at Paradox, I kind of set up the album exactly like the key, like uh, seizing the throne is kind of like it goes lake of fire standing in blood and seizing the throne is like the third song in that in that in that that little story. Yeah, but but and I mean, it all fits exactly. together because uh, I listened right. to the first Nocturnus. And then when I listened to your new stuff, I was like, and I was like skimming through the lyrics, you know what I mean? I was like, hey, you know, <laughs> I'm all, this is, goes back to here. It ties in. Yeah, like like Neolithic was the third song on the key. Mm -hmm. So Paleolithic was the third song on Paradox. Right. So a lot of it, you know, there we, we did a couple other, I didn't really want to continue, um, you know, some of the other songs like, like, well, basically undead journey and bcad kind of they were just like songs to themselves so they didn't really but i wanted to have i didn't want the whole album to be a concept either like it's great that king diamond does it but i don't want to be stuck with the All whole right. album being a concept right so i just picked the last part of the album uh where it ends and started from there like empire of the sands goes into the antechamber on paradox and then the story continues from there to the end of the album. And now with the new album, we've done the exact same thing. The last four songs are, are a continuation from Paradox. And then uh, then there's an instrumental at the end, uh, just like we did the song that we just called it number nine, just for fun. Uh, but it was an instrumental. Are and, you guys... uh, the first song is uh, actually, well, it's a little different. Uh, on this one with the, that part of the first half of the album but the third song again is is uh, called uh mesolithic so we have neolithic paleolithic and mesolithic which are you know periods of 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 history where do you get happened. these ideas for the titles well the first one actually neolithic actually davis said let's write a song about pre prehistoric stuff and call it neolithic but the thing with Neolithic was we were really young back then and the lyrics he gave me, I just worked with those and wrote a bunch of more stuff and made the song up, but it doesn't really describe the Neolithic period exactly like it should be. Uh, so when I wrote Paleolithic, it really, I went into studying the Paleolithic period in history and wrote the song around that. So then when we did the new one called Mesolithic, I did the same thing. I did a bunch of studying on what was going on in those years and, and wrote the song around that. So those are more correct than Neolithic was actually, because Neolithic talks about the dinosaurs and things like that, which wasn't really all part of the Neolithic period. Uh, it was kind of like actually a little before that, but I kind of tried to straighten it out a little bit and get it a little more correct history wise. Uh, with Paleolithic and, of course, Mesolithic. Okay. Um, are you guys going to, after the album's done, mixed, and finalized, what, what? I guess I should say, what video are you guys going to drop, you know, for what song? Well, I'm not sure. I, I'd like to do, 
I kind of want to do two this time because mm -hmm. I want to do another one that's part of the one of the four songs from from that's continued on the key story with Dr. Magus in it and everything. But then I also want to do another one of the songs that has nothing to do with anything that's been on any of the other albums, you know, like a fresh new thing. Let's so and I have different, quite different ideas for both of those. I, I don't want to give too much away right now, but one of them will be one of the four songs that, that continues the key story, of course, with Dr. Magus in it. And it's going to be probably the whole thing will probably be more like animated, like, like he was in there, but we also had the band mixed in. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I, I, the way you guys did it was awesome. It was cool, oh. but I kind of want to make this one more of like a little animated movie, you know, okay. like all just Dr. Magus, the story. And then we'll have a second video that will be something more with the band in it and, and the lyrics in, in a way that comes in a video like more, most bands do. You know, that, that's a pretty cool idea. You know, I'd like to check that out. So when it drops, send me a message. Please. Oh, yeah, we'll do one. Uh, like last time, yeah, we didn't, weren't, weren't, weren't really sure and the album came out. And then we did we, we, we put the video out after the album came out, which is not really what most people do. Usually yeah. that's the second video does that. Yeah. Uh, but they always have a first video that comes out before, but we dropped just a song instead. And it did really well. Um, but we didn't have a video for that at the time. So it was like, let's get to this video now. But we, the album came out before the video. <laughs> and so this time we're going to do that for sure. One of the, the two will come out before the album. And then we'll probably do another, the second video after the album's released. I'm going to ask you this question, Mike. Uh, on this um, recording, what challenges were... Um did you guys overcome compared to your previous album? Well, I mean, I think more, this was the time system that we ended up with, you know, all the things happening and mm -hmm. uh, other incidents going on and time wise, everybody had things going on. And, and, and because the studio was so close to Tampa, we were able to, and we didn't have a time limit on recording. We, we were all right with that because it's kind of nice. If you do an album in one week, or two weeks say you know whatever it is your budget is uh you're stuck with that and you can always go back and go man i wish i would have done this i wish i would have done that i wish i would have changed this or not did that and that's what happens when you record an album in one week or two weeks and you, you're done yeah you, you don't get to go back in there and fix things that or change things um, so how, many, us, how, how many times did you redo your drum piece um tracks like you popped an idea just popped in your head and you're like, you know what? Where well, actually that, that kind of stuff didn't really change. Okay. Um, we, what we, the, the songs, the way we had them ready to record are still exactly the same, but what mainly happened was like, we were able to go listen to the drum tracks and go, okay, this is good, but I want to put some effects here. Or I want to do this to this. It's more of like, putting ideas to the stuff we recorded. Okay, so that and goes back to all the notes that he, he's got written out for like the flangers here. Um, right, phases. exactly. exactly. Okay. It's more like ideas to, to, to accent the stuff we recorded. Like I did two versions of each song in one weekend. I did like, you know, there's like basically 11 tracks overall so i did everything well two i did like five or six each day and did two versions of each one that i liked and we kept those and worked with those so okay. picked the best one out and and uh and went went from there of the two and we're, okay there and then a couple weeks went by and they went back in and recorded the guitars you know like one guitar player did it his stuff one weekend and the other one did his the next weekend and you know it kind of went like that mm -hmm. and then uh i went in and recorded the vocals i think and then we did the keyboards and then we did the bass last but it was all spread out we you know and then when the holidays start coming around like thanksgiving because we started in october so that you know like thanksgiving all the way to to uh christmas or new year's i should say was like we didn't do anything on anything <laughs> so that yeah. was a huge break that that you know 
it, that we didn't really record or do anything with. But the good thing was what we did record, we had, you know, the ability to sit back and listen to that and go, Ooh, I want to do this here. I want to put some effects on my vocals, a delay here. I want, you know, some flanger here, things like that. And uh, so that was kind of like what I would, what I meant was why it was nice to be able to record the album over time Yeah, and sit back and listen to this and go, okay, we, we need more guitars here. Or we need to do this here. There's a lot of, extra stuff put into it there's 12 string guitar on one of the on actually two parts really uh, yeah our our uh, belial our guitar player belial he has a double neck uh 12 string guitar like jimmy page uses yeah and uh so he brought that out on a couple things and he's got a synth pedal on his guitar and so there's a lot of guitar synth along with the synthesizer now uh, you don't hear that much anymore the guitar no synth. no and um and uh like our keyboard player now versus our old keyboard player he's he do, actually does some lead you know like guitar lead type stuff on the keyboards so sometimes rather than having the two guitars left and right go back and mm-hmm. forth with leads like you know you got an eight yeah. lead section so the one 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 or you know four and four now we actually have some sections where it goes guitar keyboards guitar keyboards guitar keyboards you know like back and forth things like that that's Which, pretty cool though yeah so we actually expanded on that kind of stuff but the album's still exactly the the what we continued with paradox a lot of it you know it's the same people so we didn't change too much as far as the writing techniques and things like that we kind of tried to keep it in the same vein but there are some new things here and there too well, I'm excited to hear the new album, especially with 12 string incorporating that kind of gives it a different vibe, a different element. So that's pretty cool, though. Yeah, I mean, look at, you know, like another thing I can bring up Led Zeppelin again, you know, like some so some of the songs have seven and eight guitar tracks in them, but they were a four piece band. So, you know, but we try to do things that like with the 12 string there's an effect on the synth that guitar synth that he has that he can actually make that sound pretty close to the same. So live we, we we're going to sound this, the new songs, even though they have some extra stuff in them, we're going to have it to where when we play live, it's going to sound, you know, really similar to what's on the album. Oh, very cool. Um, well, let's see, Mike. I mean, I know you guys are recording all digital and, Let's be honest, but Paradox was recorded digital and analog, right? Well, really, with, with Paradox, it was only the drums that we did on the 24 track. Like that. And the thing, even with that is, you know, people can say, oh, well, you know, analog is the best way to go. But here's the thing. Even if you record the whole album analog, it's still going to end up digital. Yeah. You know, once you start mixing it and, and it go, it, it's going to go mastering everything is digital now you can't do this stuff analog anymore or nobody does and once it gets put on a cd it's digital yeah so i mean it was fun recording the drums analog and then but they still ended up going into pro tools you know (laughs) to to do the rest of the album so you know it was kind of like it was fun to do it but it really didn't make a huge difference like i thought it would it kind of did a little bit but not really because the but, drums ended up going into pro tools anyway but so, let me ask you a question though i mean speaking of digital cd what do you actually prefer vinyl or cd oh well i mean it's kind of hard cds don't sound that bad to me a lot of people but mm-hmm. vinyl definitely if you have a, but the thing with vinyl is you have to have a good you know record player yeah and you need to have a good system to really get what you want out of vinyl. It, it it has a sound, a warm sound, and almost real, like like the bands in the room with you on vinyl that just you can't get off a cassette or a CD. That's true. <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm always going to be a bigger fan of vinyl because of that. But you also have to have a good system to play it on. I mean, if you got a crappy record player and you put your, your album on, it's going to sound like crap. 
Right. Um, are you guys going to be releasing the album on vinyl? Oh, yeah, for sure. They'll be just like Profound Lore wants to do the same thing. They had um, colored vinyl, regular mm-hmm. vinyl. Uh, and again, because this album is even longer than the last album, it's, it's, it's like a little over an hour long that it's going to have to be put on two vinyls. Oh, that's for cool. That. Now, the okay. difference in that, too, because a vinyl can only hold so much music. If you try to go over a certain amount, it actually compromises the sound quite a bit on vinyl. Yeah. yeah. Like, say, um, I think you can do like 21, 22 minutes, something like that on vinyl on one side. But if you try to go to like 25 minutes, it actually compromises the sound of the vinyl. But with yeah. a CD, you can go, what, 80 minutes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. On CD, you can do a lot. Um Especially on reel to reel too, you can hold up to eight, twelve hours of music. Right, know? and cassettes the same way they can cut the amount of tape in the cassette to whatever mm-hmm. they want. Yeah. You know? So with the cassettes, CDs, you can put anything you want on there. But with vinyl, it has to. If you really want the vinyl to sound right, you can't put more than say twenty-one or twenty-two minutes on the on a side of vinyl, and and that's why EPs will sound even better because there's even less. Uh, on on there and so the grooves are bigger and so mm-hmm. you get a better quality sound when you think your album's going to drop um when do you think mixing is going to be done and finalized well i know we're going to do some mixing next week this or i should say this week coming up some of it's going to start and uh so but uh, since it's all recorded already and really a lot of it's kind of mixed a little bit already yeah, the, the rough mix and, yeah, we got some pretty good rough mixes already of everything. And and so it's probably not going to take that long to finish the mixing. It's just we want to do it right because we have the time to do it right. And we don't have to rush anything. And our label is good with that. So I'd rather it come out later and sound better than, you know, like I said, try to do everything in two weeks. And, it, and you're like, ah, oh, damn, I wish I would have done this or that. <laughs> right. Um, that's cool though. I mean, at, at least your label gives you all that time and the energy to create your yeah, album we'll to make that with us. I mean, because most labels don't do that. They give you a budget and a deadline, you know? Yep, exactly. And that's another reason, like I said, uh, we went with a label like, like Profound Lore because they really care about the music sounding good and, and, you know, want the artist to be happy and they don't, rip anybody off they don't try to make a huge amount of money off the artist it, everything's really really fair what and, what about and, your roach um not the royalties but your rights do you own them or is it a split deal well it's pretty much uh, you know they own their recordings but, you know okay. but we own the songs so if we want to go back later and re-record any of the songs you know a couple years from now we can do that okay so they basically own their recordings you know the recordings of the songs the masters and uh re-record any of the songs and things you know like some labels will take everything yeah no i mean that's great that you guys got a label that looks out for your interest and all that um well hell man I mean, you've answered all my questions. I don't think I got That's any good. other questions on there. <laughs> yeah. Vinyl takes, now it takes like six months to get vinyl out from when you send them the real, the masters, you know, the dats actually now, but um, when you send them the mastered versions in whatever format it's in, uh, it usually takes about six months for the vinyl to get pressed now. And yeah, because they got a backlog. Right. And, uh, and, and like he was explaining to me that like the, the smaller labels like his, he only gets so many releases a year through that company to print vinyl. Like he can't send them 10 albums and go, you know, I want vinyl on all these. He gets say, you know, a certain amount a year. So he, so has, he, to, has, to, he has to pick what bands are going to get vinyl. Right. And the time wise and everything. So it's kind of like, it's become, a lot harder to do vinyl even though even though vinyl sells more than a lot of things now oh man vinyl is expensive too now yeah well that's <laughs> because you have a couple plants that are yeah. doing it in the whole world 
Yeah, you know, no, no, no. I, I get that. I get it. I mean, like, um, what was I at? Um, I know I was at some music store the other day, and I was gonna buy um the King Diamond DI, and, and that was going like for like, I think almost fifty, sixty bucks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's just like. I, I get it. it. It's a profit out there. But back in the day when me and you were kids, you know, it was like 18, 20 bucks, you know, yeah. if that. Yeah. <laughs> if that. Exactly. Yeah. 10 bucks for an album. Yeah. In the early days, eight ninety nine, ninety nine, nine ninety nine. 99 you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I was, you know, what is isn't expensive these days? That's that's the oh, thing. Every, yeah. Everything's expensive. Food, gas. You name it. When I see what people pay to to go to a concert now, you know some of these huge bands, they're paying three thousand dollars a ticket. I know, dude. It's like really, you and need I'm, that much money? Yeah, I mean, I just don't understand it. I'm like, wow, you know, because now a hundred bucks for a ticket to a, a a good show is is normal. But and the funny thing is, back in the eighties, nineties, it was like. 24 25 bucks so, i mean you remember the the days we could go see metallica for like 20 30 bucks right you know? and now exactly. it was like metallica what 2000 1800 and so, the fees are are more than than <laughs> more than anything that the amount of fees they put on tickets is insane now i know well I mean, uh, that's kind of one of the reasons why I kind of dropped out. I mean, the whole industry is upside down. You know what I mean? It's not it really like is. It. It's gotten um, to where it's, it's, you know, you have to pick and choose who you want to see now, unless you're rich. <laughs> I got a friend that works in the oil field, right? So he's bringing home about three grand and he, he goes to like three shows out of the month. I'm like, dude, these bands, I'm all... You're taking away from no, he's all that's why I worked hard, you know. I'm like, hey, that's yeah. cool, bro. But I'm all and then on top of that, I'm all let's break it down. how much do you think of the bands getting off the ticket sell? He's all well, the fees and I'm all well that's no, that's the vendors making their money, <laughs> you yeah. know. I'm all so don't forget the vendors are gonna be making money off of the merch too. And that's crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. like if you're there selling your own merch, you physically, Mike, <laughs> and the vendor wants to get a split off of that. I mean, like, really? I mean, I can understand it if he's working it, you know what I mean? Or one of his people, then they should get like a percentage. But if you're doing it, I don't I don't get it. Well, like some of these bands, the bigger metal bands, even, you know, their 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 shirts are a hundred dollars now. I know, dude. I mean, come on, seriously, it costs you, especially when you, when you're making shirts for a tour and you're selling arenas. Yeah. Like, like a big band, I'm not going to mention any names in uh, particular, I know but if you... you know, some of the bigger metal bands, the really big ones that, that pull, you know, eight or 10,000 people a show, they're making, they're making a lot of shirts to go on that tour. Thousands. Yeah. So the price of those shirts is literally three or four dollars. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed. Hundred dollars. Yeah, but that, the, you see, making the, the shirts, opening. making the shirts has not changed on the prices. No, not much. A little bit, but not much. But here's the thing, you know. And now the the main bands are telling the the opening bands that are on the tours with them, hey, guess what? You can't undersell us on the shirt prices. So if our shirts are going for a hundred, guess what? Your shirts are going to go for a hundred. Because you're not going to sell a shirt for thirty bucks when we're selling our shirt for hundred bucks, because that kid that only has thirty bucks in his pocket to spend on a shirt is going to buy your shirt. Now they're not going to buy our shirt. So it's it's become a game even with the bands themselves to where the headlining band sets the price of their shirts and the opening bands, not in a hundred percent of the cases, but in a lot of the cases, has to match the same price of the shirts that the headlining band is charging. It's crazy, man. The whole industry, like I said, it's... Well, like I said, it comes to the fact that, you know, if, you, if you're doing this to make a living, you got to do everything you can to make every penny because every day that you're not doing something, you're yeah. not making money. No, that's true, man. But you know what, Mike? I got I respect for you. 
I understand it to a point. Yeah. And because everything else has gotten so expensive, I mean, you know, with venues and things like that, a lot of these people have insurance they got to pay for. If you rent an arena, every single person that's working from parking those cars out in the parking lot to selling drinks, you know, to, to selling the shirts to sell, you know, like the cops walking around in the, in the arena, all those people got to be paid. So when you look at it that way, you know, a big band that's touring is shelling out, you know, a ridiculous amount of money and even now the venues are even charging a lot of the bands part of the t-shirt money oh. it's like they have to buy a spot in the, in the venue they've already rented to sell their shirts then they also have to pay a percentage of the shirts they sell to the venue as well oh it's crazy but you know what mike i i got respect for you I got respect the way you're handling your business with the group and all that, because it seems like, you know what, like you said, you know, you want to enjoy life. You want to make music, but you want to have your home and all that. And I respect that. So, well, you know, I'd, I'd like, it'd be fun to be able to just tour for your whole life. And, and, and it's, it would have been possible for me to do that, but it's not really the way I did things and, and I've always had a really good job. And so I wanted to keep that job. I lost the job <laughs> when everything happened in Nocturnus and I was destitute living at my mom's house again at 22, 23 years old. Yeah. And I learned my lesson really early on. And I said, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to live at home with my parents, you know, and, 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 you know, live in the basement. I don't have a basement in Florida, but you know, I just not, I'm not going to be that person. I don't want to be that person. I want I want to have things in life that I want, but I also want to make music that I want to make. So I kind of found a way to do everything all at once, but I'm not, you know, living off the music. And and a lot of times when that does happen, people get desperate. They have to write an album in a certain amount of time. They have to put you know, half the songs on there are not even good because they, they have to get an album out by January 15th, you know, or, or something like that. You know what yeah, I mean? I got you. And it's like, I I never wanted things that way. That's why I didn't want to be on a huge label because that's the way they make, make you live. Yeah. Um, you still talk to Trey and all that as well, right? Every yeah. Yeah. We do talk now. Uh, you know, it's good. We, we got, kind of reintroduced i should say at one of their shows a couple of years ago back i think it was like 2018 2019 uh and we started talking again and then you know we text each other every once in a while then we talked a little bit more and uh after this last tour we haven't really talked i i don't know if uh he kind of disappeared i i should text him again to see how he's doing because, um, uh what about pete what's going on with pete sandoval well i just saw they're doing terrorizer again okay so, you know, again, these are things, you know, that these guys have to do to, to keep their life going. Right. But if you talk to Pete and you talk to Trey, uh, not sure they're going to remember me, but tell them Den from El Paso said a hello. Yeah. I, you know, when I did talk to Trey, he's really, he really doesn't, isn't happy about the I am morbid thing. <laughs> I can tell you that. But uh, I know uh, that for a fact, but. Well, I I know yeah. you and David had a little scuff on social media about logos and you know royalties and stuff like that. Well, you know, people don't like it when I tell the truth about things, and 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 it's it's like I can prove that we had a, a record label that David owned, and we were signed to them, and that Morbid Angel Abominations of Desolation was an album; it was not a demo, and and. I, I have facts on all this stuff. So I can prove beyond a doubt that Abominations was an album. I can uh, prove beyond a doubt that 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 certain things were, were done before David was even in the band. If you put the two albums uh, you know together, you can hear the same lyrics. I you know I and, well, why and, why do you think you, I brought up the vocal imitation? Because he mimicked you off of some of the songs you know well you know he's changed a lot of things that he's done over the years to you know i i personally haven't that much but well i mean if if you listen to old morbid angels vocals you listen to nocturnus vocals 
it's the same flow. It's the same style. And you know that's true. Yeah, well, I, I think because I play drums and I, I don't, I write this, the lyrics and a lot of people have a hard time with this. Um, I write the lyrics to, to the rhythm. Right. I don't write the lyrics to the melody. Well, okay. So that's what makes my stuff more like chanting rather than, than singing, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> and it's very rhythmic because I'm playing and singing at the same time. So the vocals go along with the drums way more than the, the rhythm of the guitar or, or the melody, I should say, of the guitar, which is what most bands write to the guitar. I'm going to ask you an interesting question here because um, this is the first time I'm asking a drummer vocalist. Breathing, singing, playing drums. How do you do it? You know, the 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 easiest way to answer that is I don't think about it. <laughs> I, I take the sticks and I just go. It's a whirlwind. Everybody, in, you know, like especially in this band, they're like, we never know what's going to happen. Yeah, I don't know what I, I just click the sticks and I go and, you know, I play things faster live. I don't play the click tracks. I, I like the energy that uh, happens. You play by feel. Yeah. And, and I always have, even like with recording, even though with this new album, it was all done in Pro Tools. What we did was I did the drums with no click track and just the two rhythm guitars, you know, uh, for the, for the raw tracks. And and what what Jarrett does is he builds a um uh, a demo a, a time no 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 like I'll record the, all the drums and then he'll mm -hmm. build um like a timing around that uh, around uh, what I think um, so if uh, I did speed up a little bar, bit in a part he's gonna keep that of course and not fix it but it's gonna have a click track but he builds the click track around what I played not the other way around. Like I didn't play to a click track. He builds the click track from what I play in Pro oh, Tools, okay. which takes a little longer to do that because it's not exactly perfect. It doesn't sound like a machine. You know, a lot of albums, the drums sound like a drum machine yeah. because they've been put in Pro Tools and they've been fixed to the point where they're just like not even, you know, there's no fluctuation of anything. Everything's exactly the same. Every what about... What what about your guitarists? Um, were they playing the click tracks or they play no, no, with you? Well, 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 basically, kind of because a click track was written by by what I played. Okay, but but so, I mean, when they when you recorded your drums, you said you were they were playing the guitars on left and right on your mm -hmm. monitors, so they were played with you at the same time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to, you know, everyone to understand that, you know, they were actually playing live with you during the recording and helping you stay in time. Right. The thing was, we had to have both guitar players do it because there's a lot of parts where they're playing different things. Mm -hmm. And there's parts where we stop and one person will do a little rhythm for a second and then we'll come in. So things like that we kind of had to have both guitar players there instead of just one person playing all the rhythms. And I play drums to that in a click, you know? <laughs> so the album has a very live sound again, like paradox did. Okay. Because I don't, I don't like being stuck to a click track. Well, I, I hate playing to a click track. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I like the feel, you know, exactly. Um, most musicians I can, apart, I can do that. No. Yeah. If I want to slow up a little bit, just a little bit here or there, like, uh, you know, like our new bass player was just talking about that with like Neolithic, you know, that one part where it kind of slows down and then speeds right back up in Neolithic. He's like, man, I always liked the way that did that. And I wondered how you guys did that timing wise. And I said, well, we did it because we did it live, you know, it, and we didn't follow a click track because we could have wrote it that way. But then even when you slowed down, it would have been steady, a steady slow. And it's not really, it just kind of goes slower, like almost the tape slows down and then it speeds back up real fast. And that was done on purpose, but, but, but that's it was cool. But it, it's natural. And I always thought, you know, bands 
when they get lower and kind of slow down a little bit and play a little lighter on the drums and things like that. It, it you know it's the feeling going on there and, and so many bands now every beat every roll every tom every kick every snare is exactly the same level because it's been put in a computer and and mapped out that way see and this is the thing i like the music to breathe and have punch have energy mm-hmm. and when it's steady through everything it's just kind of it loses that energy of you know the feeling right and yeah that's the only thing about digital i don't like it's because when everyone's playing through that click track you sound the same like everybody else yeah you can be different genres you know it's just the same thing you can do that in digital you can get feeling out of digital it's just you can't you know you have to do things the way you would do them live and then yeah you're your stuff around that no and and this is what i'm talking about like you guys play literally live right there your guitars and you to make your own drum tap um yep. mapping it you know so you're actually the tempo for them when they come in and all that so they're playing by you now and right so and that but it still has character it has feeling it has emotion and that's what you miss from the what the other groups are doing. They're playing like 280 beats straight through everything. Where's the definition of the character, the element that's missing? You, you know what I mean? You. Yeah. I mean, not that that's a bad thing. A lot of people like that in music. A lot of people like it very sterile and not, no effects on the vocals and, you know, things like that. But I mean, that's great. I mean, everybody has different ears and everybody has different things that they like. No two people hear the same song and, and it affects them the same way. So I, I agree. Yeah, that's just the way it is. And and I don't really to the point where uh, I'm not making a living off of it. I don't care if people like what I do or not. I do it because I want to do it. And and it might be way different, but I think that has a thing to say that. I don't think that anything I've ever put out, anybody can like say it sounds like something else. That sounds like you. And that's what right. I'm saying. You know, so that's that's the whole thing about what I respect about you, because when you listen to it, you you hear all the elements that we're talking about, feeling, breath, energy, you know, it's all in there because you already know a song flows and it breathes, you know. And that's what you're doing with your music. And that's what I respect about you, Mike. Oh, thanks. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I of course, I have stuff that I love and mm-hmm. bands that I love to listen to and things like that. But I've never wanted to say, oh, I want to sound like this. Yeah, you know, I might take small elements from things <laughs> and use that. But it's never going to be like, I don't want to be the next, even, you know, like every band I've been in, Morbid Angel sounds nothing like Nocturnus. Nocturnus sounds nothing like you know, what I did with Asheron and, you know, and I tried to make After Death a little different too. But uh, then when, when I did Nocturnus AD, even though it was the same people, I did try to make it more like Nocturnus than After Death. Yeah, because it just made sense to do that. Yeah, but you know what? It worked. And like you said, I mean... And I even mean, Nocturnus AD is still different from Nocturnus. Oh, well, you can hear the elements are totally different and from Nocturnus. Right. But, you know, once we go back into the storyline, you hear the similarities. And you know, right. that's what I like about Nocturnus, the story elements and um, keyboards and, you know, let's say pre-concept, you know, all, all those work together because, you know, what what you did works and that's why i say about you guys are the first ones that started bringing in certain elements that no one was doing and i like that you know that's what makes nocturnus ad nocturnus who they are yeah i think it you know not thinking overthinking things too much <laughs> has a lot to do with it and, and just just being yourself and writing what comes out naturally is is a lot bigger than 
oh, I like this riff that that so and so did. So you know, I want to have this in my music too. Mm -hmm. I I don't understand that. Um, um I was I was gonna ask you on your drums, like, do you ever mix in like um, let's say your snare. Do you ever change it out with like, you know, trying to figure out like you want a different snare sound? Um, so you'll get like a let's say like an orchestra snare. Have you ever tried that? Played around? No. Um, and and here's the thing, uh, the only thing that's triggered, actually triggered, you know, on, on the album is the kicks because I I use uh, a Roto Tom set with with Vistalite kicks. So they're the kicks are nineteen seventies Vistalite. Oh, okay. which means they're clear, you know, they're, and they're, they're made of an acrylic. So they're not wood. So the kicks on, on, on an acrylic kit don't sound that fantastic. And I, I like a huge real sounding kick. So I, that's what I went for on that sound, but the snare is, is the snare, you know, there's no sound like triggering it at all there's no trigger on that it's just a sm57 mic on the snare top and bottom but that's it i my snare is a, is a 1968 ludwig uh super sensitive uh one kind of like bonham used but but bonham used a, a deeper one uh mine's just the standard uh 14 by i think it's five and a half uh he used the deeper snare but uh, the superphonic, super sensitive snare uh, that Ludwig made, it's a 1968 snare. Cool. And that, you know, and and uh, my toms are roto toms, all of them. So, and Jared even was like, you know, he, he well, this is our second album with him. So he knew I was going to do that. But when I first came in there, even with Paradox, he's like, what are you doing with roto toms? You know, it's good to use them for a couple things, but you want the whole album recorded with the Roto Toms? And I'm like, yeah, exactly. I want this sound that hardly anybody does. So, you know, he made a way when we recorded him, he got them to sound really good. Oh, that's I mean, good. most people record the Toms from the top anyway, so it's not really that much of a difference in that, but it is harder to make a Roto Tom sound good in the studio than a, than a real Tom, you know, a wood shell Tom. <laughs> So everything on that album, except, like I said, the only thing, the sound that's triggered, you know, to say is, is the kick sound. And that's, uh, um, and you're using the same ones live, right? Same drum set? Yeah. Well, I mean, that, the thing is, that's when we play here. Uh -huh. When we fly somewhere, I have to play to what's there, on which the is another end. thing that, that kind of sucks with that angle too, because we don't have the uh, ability to take, all our drums and you know all my drums on the road you know uh now if we were doing a tour of the u.s on a bus and stuff i could take my drums okay. but if we're going to europe to play a festival there's no way i'm, I'm we have that kind of a budget to take my drum set over there right yeah, no I but but i mean it is nice that um you get similar i mean i don't know how close they can get to your sound you know, being in Europe or whatever. Are you guys going to be doing any shows in the near future down here in the States? And Well, we will. Yeah. When, once the album's coming out, you know, we'll definitely be doing stuff to do that. But again, you know, we're not going to do any large tours or anything, but mm -hmm. we will. That's why it, the good thing is, for some reason with the situation is, you know, because we've done well and because I've done other things in my life with other bands that do well, uh, or did well, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I can get on festivals and stuff, and you can do one festival and play to like ten thousand people, or you can play twenty clubs with 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 a you know five hundred people in them. No. Yeah. So, so to me, which one are you, you going to try and do? Well, we've always tried to do you know the festival thing, and mm -hmm. then you know maybe while we're gone for, you know, we'll do things. I mean. I've literally taken Thursday, Friday, and Monday off of work and been in Europe playing two big festivals Friday and Saturday night, and I'm back to work, you know, Monday or Tuesday. <laughs> you know, it's um, kind of Jack strange. Lad, Jack Lad's got to be killing you when you get back home. It, it does for a couple of days, but, you know, it's kind of fun to, to be like Wednesday or Thursday I'm at work, 
you know, working my regular job. Then Friday night, I'm in in Prague at the Brutal Assault Festival, playing in front of you know ten thousand people. And then then you know Sunday, I'm on a plane. Then Monday or Tuesday, I'm back at work again. It's kind of weird, <laughs> but we do it, you know. And it actually, you know, it works for us. Oh, that's cool. I mean, that's. I mean, you're enjoying it. That's all that matters. So yeah. Oh, that's cool, Mike. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and cut it off right here.